cheat, right? You're saying it's there. <laughs> we're, not, we're still figuring it out. We're still just looking it's, at it's this. It's on the video now. I, I don't I don't know what more people want. It's there. Like it, it is in the video functioning, doing chi things. It, like, it, it's there, I know, but- it, What do you need? Oh what do you need from me? I, I look, right, it's, it, there's, it's brilliant because there's still more questions. It's like, okay, yeah, you 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 play the card. If you play the blue card, you can activate all three. You transcend, okay, transcend. Transcend turns into a chi. It, that, that's a three resource token. Where is this living? Is this living in my mum's car? Is it in the basement? Is it on the board? It, do I spend it? What happens when I spend it? I'm assuming it's the blue resources. I know you can't say, but what can you say? Look like blue resources to me. <laughs> uh, I've, I've never seen a resource co card live on the arena before. That would be pretty weird. So I, I don't know. I just feel like at this point, we have we have given you the pieces. And, you know, after a couple days, there'll be more pieces. And I think, uh, you know, it was very purposeful that yeah. we began the reveal of the Transcend mechanic on cards that do not feature the reminder text. Uh, <laughs> there are cards that feature reminder text and very much illustrate exactly what is going on here. I'm sure you will have them very shortly and all will be laid bare. The mystery of Chi will be solved and then we'll move on to the mystery of the hundreds and hundreds of other cards in this set that are awesome and loads of fun to play with and the mystery of how good are these heroes and how do we build these decks and uh, by the time we start solving those mysteries, it'll be time for the next mystery season, which will also be fun. So. Yes. Uh, I, I, there was um, a lot of talk, by the way, everyone, it's uh, Brian Gottlieb. If you do not know uh, Brian Gottlieb, lead designer and lead developer, is that? So se senior game designer. The lead game designer is and always will be James White. Okay. Flesh and Blood. Okay. And okay. That yeah. is, I feel like that's kind of like an insurmountable barrier. I mean, maybe there'll <laughs> be a set or two where I just like, you know, James is working on one thing, I'm working on another thing, and I end up with a lead designer credit or whatever. But as far as who the lead designer is, it will always be James White. Uh, and I, I support his efforts in, in doing so. And then I am also a lead game developer. Oh, fantastic. So um, back onto the um, part, the Mist Veil. So this set is... Um... I, is it, this is a, a really exciting set from what I'm just sort of like, I don't know, just reading, reading the vibes here. Heavy hitters is like a real good so, solid foundation set, but this one, oh, this one. Yeah. It's, it's a big swing, big swing, a little, a little bit more wild, a little bit more out there. And it, I think it is good to have a mix of both those things. It's great to return to traditional flesh and blood and melee combat and hanging out in the arena, trying to kill one another. And then it's also awesome to do, cool mystical somewhat creepy uh maybe a little bit horny stuff as well like yeah. i think all those bases <laughs> being covered is 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 good yeah no i'm i'm really excited it has this real vibe of uprising with it maybe because i'm just being a bit lazy because there's mm. an illusionist and a ninja in the set like it was in uprising um but then you've tied in the assassin side of things and i know from hearing a lot of your old interviews as well that uh, theme and story are baked into design, right? Why would it's not just because we want to make a strong illusionist? I'm not even going to waste your time going down that road because you've said it hundreds of times, but it's too easy to make something strong. It's better to make something thematically just make sense, right? Um, yeah. Why do these heroes do what they do? So, what's what, what, what's is it always been these three sort of classes that one of you touched is because I'm sure Miss Vale is bigger than just these three, right? You know, it, it is like from the beginning of planning this set, it was these three classes and it was because these are kind of viewed as the three core mystery and classes. We spent a lot of time, you know, reading a bunch of the original vision documents around Mysteria and there are, you know, significant amounts of just, I'll call it lore. It's not quite lore. It's more like vision documents yeah. and artistic guidelines and things like that that uh, paint a much larger picture than has thus far been revealed to the world. Mm. And so we spent a lot of time with those documents just really thinking about what Mysteria is, what happens in Mysteria, who's in Mysteria. 
And after spending time with those questions, it just very naturally led us to these three classes. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, um, and as well, there's this whole, with, with, which you've been, we've just been talking about chi. How fun was that trying to, was that like something that was always like trying to get that design in? Like how was this chi? Th- and it's kind of a hard one because we still don't know really too much about it but when it was sort of con- conceived that you're going to go to Mysteria and this is what you're going to do was like Chi the sort of the first sort of pillar thing I don't you know it's it, it wasn't in this case uh, so it was more about defining the mystic talent mm-hmm. what does the mystic talent actually encompass what does it do what is it rooted in And then after building that out for a period of time, talking through that, uh, you know, getting some of the, I guess you'd term them sub mechanics of the set in place. Sure. Them leading naturally to the place where Chi was the way uh, we wanted to really flesh out that Mysterian identity and uh, show how important this kind of, uh, you know, transcendence of mind is to this culture and how important it's going to be to gameplay as well. And uh, Chi was a very ambitious mechanic, a lot of work, and one that there's going to be, I think, I don't know if concern is the right word. There, there are <laughs> aspects of, of Chi yeah. that are different, and they're outside the normal spaces. And anytime we go outside normal spaces, there's always some trepidation, some concern. Uh, and... I will just say we went through some very extra steps to experience Chi as the real world will. And that's not always the case because we work with, um, you know, just very prototype versions of cards and uh, often engage in our actual gameplay in sometimes a more expedient manner, shortcutting things just for efficiency's sake. But we were very, very adamant that we had to experience Chi exactly as the real world would and uh i having spent a lot of time with it very comfortable with it it plays very well yeah it looks it looks really exciting um just as this you know sitting on the the outside of this um it's also one of those things i wanted to sort of ask is like how com is is this set one of the most one of the more complex sets that you've sort of been designing and developing. I know that they're, you're a year ahead and there's some probably some other yeah. funky other ones coming down the line, but from where we are now, from part of the Miss Vale backwards, is this one a complex set for new players to jump into? I think there are elements of this set that are more complex. I don't think it reaches the complexity ceiling of something like bright lights Mm -hmm. um i do think it is still a grade below that but there are just kind of more unique mechanics that push outside of traditional flesh and blood realms a little bit and that always makes things a little bit more complicated for newer players because you're asking them to do more there's also uh so if you're familiar with the way we've been doing our blitz decks recently we always include this little tip card and it's just kind of some you know, very quick hitting notes to tell you how to get your feet wet with these heroes. And then we always close with a difficulty rating that is designed to say, you know, this is a complicated hero to play. Don't feel bad if you don't pick it up right away. We gave out our first five-star rating on these tip cards for Enigma. And that is less rooted in mechanical complexity. On its face, what Enigma does is somewhat simple playing it well and getting the maximum out of the hero can be a little bit harder and that's the thing we really wanted to you know make new players aware of but uh one of the great things about enigma as a hero is that while it does introduce that level of complexity for the player playing it i actually think it's a pretty simple hero to play against as far as illusionist goes it feels a lot simpler than something like dromai or prism which is kind of a cool advancement in how illusionists work i think it's a real uh it's a real good step for us making illusionists long-term sustainable in the game and a little bit less polarizing because look illusionists are always going to be polarizing i don't think we're ever going to defeat that entirely some people love it some people hate it 
I think Enigma's a little bit less polarizing than some previous, uh, you know, previous illusionists. Yeah, I, I, this ties in. I got a couple of uh, patrons just to sort of throw out some questions as well. And one of them was tying into uh, the Spectra mechanic. Uh, it, Spectra, when it first came out in uh, Monarch with Prism, yep. it was a... Uh... It was a it was a very very strong <laughs> me- mechanic where it literally just stopped a lot of things happening and it got pushed even further with Everfest. It was there a lot of learning that came from that that made you go, I don't think we want to, or do we want to touch this more? Do we want to try and make this work, or do we go and leave it as it is and go these exist, um, yep. deal with it? Like and especially now that you've got a new illusionist coming in and it seems so blue heavy. And then ever has Everfest has got these amazing blue spectras. Do you know what I mean? It's people are yep. starting to pull this together. Yeah. I was not part of the team when spectra was being made. I wasn't oh, part of the yeah, team when spectra that. was revisited. So I, I can't really speak to the Genesis of that mechanic. No, no, I can only speak to my experience as a player. Yeah. When I found flesh and blood, I played a lot of prism. I, I loved, Playing Prism, I, one of my favorite heroes still to this day. I hate the Spectra mechanic. I do not like it. I I think it is unintuitive. I think it brings a lot of rules baggage with it. Mm-hmm. Um, it prevents players from playing the game of flesh and blood they want to play on the other side in a way that I don't even think. Uh, you know, dragons are a much better form of Spectra in my eyes. Like being able to engage directly with the thing and. Uh, you know, it, it's just so much cleaner in a way that Spectra was not. So I am not in any rush to return to Spectra. No. I'm not saying it'll never happen. Maybe there will be a Spectra card we make again. It's kind of one of those things where the cat's out of the bag. And if Spectra exists, you can probably get away with making like another Spectra card if it does something really exciting, really cool, really fun which is going to be hard for Spectra. But maybe there's a way <laughs> we figure out a way to make yeah, it really maybe. fun. But was it, was it kind of like... You know, because you're de- making another illusionist, and when you looked at Droma, it was, you know, you there is one or two spectres that get thrown into the into the mix. You know, Passa Mirage, good little buffer for the dragons, but it's not something you know that you had to lean on. But when you see this other new illusionist, and you're starting to see the spectral shield terminology coming in again, you know what I mean? There is it when you're designing that. Was it very much in your mind that we have got this? You you've came in. There's this baggage sitting here. Like, are you designing it to go intentionally for it to kind of make it a bit awkward for players to choose to put this into their deck, or is it something that goes, well, okay, we'll let these spe- we'll let these cards that we have let exist become part of the like the way this hero works. And I know that it's yep. probably not going to work because, well, not I don't know, but what I mean is is that the set has to make sense in its set. Right, so the cards within it have to talk to each other. But in the bigger picture of the CC world, when everyone creates their own decks, is there a thing that you, I don't know, worry about a little bit, that Spectra is going to make a little return from the players? Something we observe. I mean, something we see how this works out. I I wouldn't say we went into the process with sort of the idea that, oh, if Spectra is a part of this we have to reset and go back and that's completely unacceptable. Yeah, yeah. It's more let's let's see how Spectra is involved in this equation. Let's see how important it is. And kind of I think just you're distancing yourself from the idea of asking a question about Spectra. You're asking a question of is this fun to play with and against? Like it it is broader than that. And yeah. if if Spectra could be included in a hero in a healthy manner that was really fun to play against. I would have no qualms against it. It's just really hard to make that happen. So the question is track Spectra, see how it integrates into a new hero. What is the overall hero experience like? If it's good, you can kind of sidestep the question of Spectra a little bit. You don't have to be as pointed as to uh, address specifically this mechanic. But all of this is like kind of beating around the bush. Like this is, a, uh, in my opinion, I think this is a more aesthetically and just gameplay wise <laughs> pleasing illusionist to play against and part of that is that 
Spectra is certainly not a core focus of this hero. It is it is something that exists, but it's in the background. Oh, awesome, awesome. We'll move on from the illusionist side, but back to the assassins. Assassins, mm. I think I do. I think assassins, and I do think of you because obviously that the introduction of a uh, Arachne came in. It was uh, something that I tie myself to yourself, and again, uh, Azuri comes out. That's a big thing that I can see that you're very proud of that design space and where that's leading. And now we've into another assassin, new, which is uh, one of my uh, patrons, Darren Hazelton asked that you, there's some puns to names. We can see, you know, uh, there's, there's a tie in somewhere. Uh, new, uh, is that no or new? It's what's the, what's the, what's the, is this original or what? Honestly, don't know. I honestly don't know where that name came from. Uh, you know, sometimes I, I am involved in like the early naming process, but a lot of it comes first from James and then goes through the creative team. Um, and I, I have no idea yeah. where the new name comes from. You can yeah. see Enigma. You can see Zen. You can go, yeah, I can yep. I can see it. I can see it. I can, and then New. I'm like, oh, okay. What yeah, is... I'm not sure. No, not sure. Fair enough. Okay. But New, how for you, this design, the way she is, this, you know, it's a little, a little sexy. Little sexy assassin, is that something? Is that one of your, um, again, another assassin that you got jumped into and really worked on, or was this something that that James had first? You know, I'm just curious, really. What, like, again, uh, assassinating you, yeah. <laughs> at, at this at this point, I am just fully integrated, like, like at the, the dynasty point in time when I was working on Arachne, that was something that was just kind of. Uh, brought to me as a little bit of a side project and like something put on my plate but i'm so integrated to the team at this point just everything crosses my plate so it's not sure. as specific as i have this hero to work on or anything um but you know one of the james and i sat down the other day and we kind of ranked the heroes <laughs> that or the classes that we liked working on the most which is a weird thing to do like it kind of like I, I could see how people are just like oh you're just gonna work on the classes you want it's not really that it's more about like how much depth do we think is in a class like how you know when we sit down to make a set feature in a class how easy is it for us yeah like how fluid are the ideas assassin was at the top of both of our lists and part of the reason is that there's a broadness in theming because assassin is just kind of like a goal. It's not a prescription. So the idea yeah. is I kill you, right? My goal is to eliminate you, to assassinate you. But there's no presuppositions about how I have to go ahead and do that. Um, and then that modality gets reinforced via stealth, which is a card that just changes depending on who the assassin is, which is also another really cool feature of yeah. the class. But where there exists that kind of modality, you just have unlimited creative potential. And the idea of exploring this succubus myth, this uh, you know assassin that kills via a more insidious way of sort of turning your own thoughts against you and and shaping your desires to be their tool and to yeah. enable them to uh, <laughs> you know let you work against your own self-interest it was just an awesome really deep really cool theme reflected in so many of the mechanics you're going to see throughout the assassin card pool in this set uh and it was a ton of fun to work on i can just tell that i it, it's I can just sort of, as you're going through it, I can just feel like the horror aspects of it, of like, you know, we, we, it's, it's when you watch those horror films where that person brings you in with all kindness and then it, and then it starts to shift and turn and everything. Well, there's you, that moment, there's that moment in the trailer. If you've watched the trailer I've watched a million it. times, like I have, I have, yeah. where, you know, new is using this very, uh, seductive voice throughout and yeah. very like soothing, calm. Mm. And then there's this, shift in tone where enigma and new are kind of bouncing their lines back and, and then forth. she says look at me yeah that bit yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's, that's, I mean, that's exactly it yeah. right it's you know kind of breaking the veneer and understand the danger and the fear that you are currently facing uh I, again just a very thematically rich 
canvas to paint on yeah with this original concept i could see that you brought back um stealth into the the into the fold of um of new and yep. was it a thing that um i suppose really when we saw uh, arachne with contracts and then you saw azuri with stealth and it was this and the players eventually got there we about how to in sort of with azuri more um i feel integrating both of those sort of things was it a very conscious decision to go i'm going to stick we're, we're going to work with stealth a bit more on this and and not so much contract i'm intrigued about that from what i've read yeah stealth just has again going back to that modality right mm. like stealth can do so many different things and we get to provide for multiple card pools simultaneously it's a little less siloed uh, you know, not to say contract doesn't have a place. Contract is really cool. It is just a different mode of assassin. Like it, it again comes back to that modality. There's the contract killer. There's the, you know, killer for sport. There's the succubus. There's all these different types of assassins. Um, and I think stealth is easier to fit, particularly into a limited environment. And I, yeah. I think that's a huge portion of it is it asks very interesting questions because we have the stealth baseline, right? Like yeah. we know what stealth attacks are. They are zero for threes without go again, which is bad. Like that's bad <laughs> under yeah. traditional <laughs> flesh and blood terms. And the puzzle of how do you make that good is very interesting. It's very cool, especially in the limited context. Uh, you know, there could be a time where we go back to contract in both constructed and limited formats. Stealth was just a better fit here. And it, it again, allowed us to tell a very cool story. Yeah, no, I can, I can tell, I can tell. And then we go, and then we're moving over to Zen, this amazing new ninja that um, I particularly am very excited for. I really, I really enjoyed um katsu's combo mechanics i think that very to me when i first got getting into the game that this was like this real cool fighting game where you're actually just trying to juggle like you know if you played a fighting game you knock them up into the air and then bang them bang them bang them bang yeah you got to complete the combo so that was like oh this is awesome really 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 cool and fi i mean just talking out of, like for my me personally as a uh as a player of the game i felt like it was a bit of a step back from the complexity side of things because it just evolved around chain link and it wasn't about trying to sequence mm -hmm. the state. It didn't it kind of mattered about the sequencing, but not as much as what Katsu is. And now we've got this new hero coming out with again it just feels like we're we're getting we're we're back into the combo matters like sequencing these cards in the right way. Was it kind of a bit of a tricky dance to sort of go, how do we we don't want it like a cat, another katsu, if that makes sense. Like when you're thinking ninja, was that quite of a tricky sort of design sort of thing to go through to not make it look like another hero? Because I know it's very important for you. You don't want another prism. So prism had angels and it's a different way, right? Yeah. So she feels different. I, I actually think this one was pretty easy once we honed in on the tiger aspect, which I recall being there from the beginning i don't remember a version of this hero <laughs> yeah, that was yeah. not focused on crouching tigers and once you know you're doing you know crouching tiger plus combo well the paths become pretty clear you understand exactly what you want to set up you understand what you want to benefit you know you buff some tigers you have cards that combo with tigers uh you have cards that benefit future tigers it it, it just is a fairly clear pathway to explore what's interesting is keeping that modality that flexibility of combo the way katsu has it mm -hmm. and i think we have threaded a nice needle with zen where it's quite fun to play again and uh does lean in to that combo side of things anymore uh, a little bit more like it's it's quite interesting so katsu completes a combo mm -hmm. with some exceptions there's things like dishonor where you know there are game altering abilities tied on but a lot of times katsu completes a combo and the result is sort of marginal buffs down the chain you know you get a plus one here yeah. go again there obviously bonds can pop off in a big way yeah um <laughs> but that's something that is newer to katsu's identity i guess i'm speaking more of like core katsu right now yeah. and 
initially you completed those combos and you just yeah, you had some nice attacks good mm. for you congratulations yeah we stepped that up a little bit with outsiders i think we kind of take it to another level with zen where there are some combos that if you complete them you have messed your opponent up like you probably have won the game congratulations glad you got that combo in uh you got to work for it but good. you you get there and you complete these things and you have absolutely popped off and uh, look you've you've probably done it with katsu before quite frankly if you've played any i played it, katsu. i i play against it i'm a visceral okay. boy i like bolton yep. i play against katsu but i've mucked about but yeah it's the if you've seen katsu pop off with crouching tigers you know there is a lot of potential in that mechanic yeah and zen taps into a lot of that potential a little bit more so how exciting was he I, I suppose really as well just like the, the the flavor of all these characters as well is just really exciting is there is there one that you are like you know if you had to pick a side just out of breath not not designer take it well just you'll imagine yeah. you saw this for the first time which one are you like hmm am i the wind I, water or moon i i think it's enigma which is strange for me to kind of go against assassins but I'm really happy with the way Illusionist has been shaped in this set. And I also call out that young Enigma art, which I think is unlike anything that exists for a hero in the game yeah. thus far. And yeah. it just, it really does speak to me. There's an astounding amount of beautiful art in this set. Like, yeah. you're not ready for what you're about to see over this coming <laughs> preview season from an art perspective. It is... Unlike anything we've seen in Flesh and Blood before, it flirts with a lot of different modes, a lot of different uh, backgrounds, a lot of different, you know, traditional styles of art that have not been captured before. And I think the artistic palette has really expanded with this set in the best way possible because it has yielded some jaw-dropping results for sure. Oh, I, I'm very excited because just that, that young illusionist uh, Enigma art I'm, I've never, I was like, I'm not going to be the illusionist player. I, I, you almost got me with drama. I almost got me with drama. But no way am I a prison player, man. I'm, I'm a demonistry dude through and through, you know, rock and roll. And then I did see this and I was like, oh man, this does look really, really nice good. Looking. And I just literally, I don't even know what's coming. And I just went, all right, it's going curb market. Let's have a look at some illusionist stuff. Let's uh, let's spend some uh, let's spend some money. Might work, might not work, but even I've now started to put some money in just because it just looks rad. It just looks yeah. honestly quite rad. It it is it is it absolutely is. Okay, um, so we'll, uh, we'll we'll move on from the part of the miss fail side of things. I think uh, unless there's anything exciting that you just wanted to sort of throw in there. Cause I wanted to just quickly move over to pro tour LA. I, I don't have anything in particular. I just <laughs> am so play safe. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, yeah, no, I'm just okay, like yeah. very, I'm very anxious for everyone to get to see this set. Like yeah. I'm, I'm talking visually eyeballs on this set. It is so striking and stunning i think the it's not only the creative team obviously the creative team has done a tremendous job but even things like the marvels in this set oh, like, it's yeah. just it's just very like there there's a lot there's a lot in this set in the best way possible there's just so much cool stuff for so many people i think it is going to be looked at as a a special set in flesh and blood history it is uh, pushing some boundaries, doing some new things, offering a lot to players. I don't think it's sort of like a shift. I don't think it's a new mode of Flesh and Blood. It's just we really pulled out a lot of stops for this one because we were so in love with so many of the concepts. And it's just like, well, we have to do this. We have to do something cool around this. And, and then we did. And it all came out awesome. And I can't wait for people to experience it. I'll throw in this last, the, the one more thing. And I know it's not your area but one of the things that really gets spoke up a lot is just the it's the law it's the fluff right 
it's the we've got flesh and blood is a game about these heroes and characters and when i started up playing this the one of the biggest reasons why i fell in love with this game is because I, one i'm an edge lord and i like this right right but this right also got this amazing story built in so as i was deciding which which hero do i want to spend my money on I just read up the law and I was like, oh God, this this guy had so much like, there's a cool story behind this. I understand why who he is and what he's doing. And is there going to be, and I know it's a hard question to ask because you're a designer and not the that side of the thing. Is there more, is there stuff that's going to be coming out to attach people to these heroes with this law stuff, which something that I will say that feels like it's, once more but it hasn't came out more yet yeah does that, so i don't I, want to be candid i'm just trying to be just you know yeah, just honest. I, I i can't answer that question it's not my department of but I, what i will say is that uh the creative team had has a tremendous amount of responsibility placed on their plate that goes beyond things like lore things like you know getting all this amazing art together and uh being able to produce that in time and continually kind of raising our standards, also continually raising the number of unique art pieces that appear per set. That is all just a tremendous, tremendous uh, drain on their time. And frankly, we needed to build out that creative team a bit, get them some help, get them some support. That has taken some time, but more and more people are joining that creative team as time goes on. We are... as. And this is just an LSS wide thing Mm. where we have this level of success. We have this great game and you need more and more people to be able to deliver on that. And it takes time to get those people in places. And you can look to my own involvement with things now, but we've also built out our development team quite a bit. We just added uh, a couple new members very recently, which we're very excited about. And we've continued to build out, you know, basically every single team within LSS, maybe you've seen, uh, my buddy Cedric Phillips lurking around yeah. Pro Tour LA, like absolutely building out the marketing side of things, which he's going to be working on. So there's just team after team that's being built up. That includes the creative team. And I know they are very, very uh, excited, willing, hoping to be able to go ahead and get some more of those lore pieces out. I hope that they are able to find the time to do so with the release of Part of the Misfit. I, und- I have the a- I know this, but I wanted to give. But I know that people would ask, and it's one of those. Uh, it's things. a yeah. totally fair question. <laughs> yeah. A totally fair question, and I, I assure you that everyone within LSS, especially on that creative team, would love to get some of those lore pieces out. Uh, and are I am extremely hopeful they get to turn the corner and get a little bit more of that out there for well, folks. Awesome, Pro Tour LA. How how was that vibe for you, right? I asked the same question Wild. to the, the, to Max and to Arthur and to Daniel Corius, um in our interview. And I suppose really when you walked into that space, how was the feeling and the vibe for you there? Yeah, I think it just got kicked off in exactly the right way with the Players Banquet and the first look at the part the Miss Vale trailer. And yeah. it's, when you start the weekend on such a high, it does kind of carry over but there was other aspects too there's obviously heavy hitters very well received set yeah there was uh you know the epot promo on offer there was just a a general good positive vibe in the room we're in a uh certainly a premium location right there in downtown la lots of amenities nearby um you know, plenty of stuff to do. If you wanted to go to Kings games, Lakers games, good restaurants, all that stuff was available to you. So it it definitely felt high end is the way I would describe it. Like a a little bit, uh, like a little bit of a step up from some of our other venues and efforts. And I, I think that was sort of the trend throughout the weekend. Everything felt like a little bit of a step up like we were getting a lot of things in places and again like it all comes back to building out teams getting people in the right place so you go back a couple years with the flesh and blood organized play system and there was a constant struggle to sort of give advance notice about events like everything was uh, uh, just a couple months before you find out where something was it was very tight schedule and it wasn't you know anyone's fault it's just 
we launched a global initiative very, very quickly and it was successful. And then we needed to add more and more and get it up to speed and get it up to size. And yeah, that is very, very challenging. And now with great people in place on that side of things, you know, you saw a huge amount of lead time for LA. We were able to announce Worlds, mm -hmm. which is in uh, late October, early November. So you've got over seven months notice for where Worlds is going to be. A huge, huge improvement there. Yeah. Um, so in all aspects of delivering these Pro Tours, these organized play offerings, it felt like we were taking a step up. And I phrased this weekend as it felt like turning the corner in a lot of instances like we just kind of like not to say we're done not to say it was perfect not to say there aren't a bunch of things that could be improved but it felt for the first time that we were kind of delivering a bit more on our vision like yeah. the way these things were to play out in our minds actually were happening uh and it felt really good it felt like a really positive step for the game oh well, that's 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 amazing I, I i could feel it and i'm sitting you know, a thousand miles away in the UK, and I can just yeah. and I can feel that as well. What was your highlight moment? Like, I know there's going to be loads. I know there's going to be loads. But when it's, I say that, it's the question, sigil, bro. It, no, it's the sigil. The like, sigil. It's that simple. <laughs> it's it's the that sigil. simple. Like I have been casting games for. I'm trying to think when I started. I think I did my first ever cast in either 2017 or 2018. So you're talking six or seven years now, and. Obviously, as a broadcaster, be it sports, be it TCGs, be it anything, you sort of envision these moments, right? These moments that are huge and epic and live on in history. And you kind of ask, you know, what's going to happen if I ever encounter one of these moments? You sort of try and, I won't say engineer them, but you, pr you try to leave yourself in a good position should they ever naturally develop in the course of a game where you're able to pay them off. And in these seven or eight years that I have been doing this, it's never happened for me. I, I, I can't <laughs> think of another moment where it was like that level of everything has to come to exactly this point and exactly this outcome has to happen. And then it becomes determinative, not only of the game, but of the entire pro tour. Like yeah. that is so so statistically unlikely to happen <laughs> and in the aftermath i was like i had really never felt anything emotionally like it from a casting side i felt like empty and drained and like i had gone through this massive come down because my adrenaline was so high in that moment and I, I think, I don't know, but I think somewhere out there, there is a video splice and there was actually oh, a is. camera on Mitch and I, as we were calling this. Yeah. And I am pretty sure, like, I think I just grabbed him. Like, I really think I just reached over and was like shaking him <laughs> because it was just completely <laughs> unbelievable. And I know like... I, I went home the next day and I had a big scratch on my neck. And I don't know if like we were just like throwing hands. I, I honestly almost blacked out in the moment and don't even understand what happened. But like you heard it on the stream. That was us screaming. That was Ponkage and Sam and Ethan and Justin in the production booth. Literally, like it felt like chaos. Like it felt like the entire room just exploded. And I know it was like a very small area, but still that emotion was there because we were all so invested and building towards that one moment. And yeah, yeah I, I, it was incredible. It really was incredible. It, I can, I, I can just, I can just tell, right. That when I was, because <laughs> it was like one in the morning, I'm laying in bed. My wife's fast asleep. I've got my phone here. And the second he drew the sigil, I was like, oh, no. Oh, oh, my God. And I woke my little door. <laughs> it was, my wife was just really cross, but I can just hear the the absolute energy and excitement from, from, from yourselves it as well. Wild. It just was absolutely wild. I, in my wildest dreams, I could have never anticipated an ending like that to a pro tour, a pro tour that was played immaculately throughout and had all these amazing narratives and... Uh, Arthur just playing 
godlike flesh and blood, just out of his mind, incredibly, incredibly gifted player. Uh, for it to end like that, I couldn't, I couldn't ask for a better conclusion to the pro tour. Absolutely. Needless to say, right, that um, Europe, the European scene is doing pretty well. Doing pretty well, I have to say. Not bad. Not, not bad. Not pro bad. tour champion under your coffers once more at all European finals, Germany versus France. And uh, obviously Europe extremely well represented throughout that top eight. Uh, a top eight which featured eight yeah. different countries, by the way. An incredible, incredible run uh and just showing like what a global game flesh and blood has become at this point yeah it was it was it was amazing to just sort of to see for, for me obviously because you know we were a dude from europe but then when you when you're um it's really weird to have that concept but as european countries all do need to kind of like band together to get to to sort of feel that united front because america is a huge place and i imagine the apex region sure. also go through that same sort of level as well that because the 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 market and the and and everything about America, it's all it's just such a huge juggernaut to try and deal with. So whenever a European region like needs to band together, we all need to band together to get to to sort of feel like we can compete in a sense. Maybe I'm just talking out of my bum here, but that's that feeling that we've all got to band together because just one little nation alone. It's like, yeah, that's cool, but seeing a whole region is actually more likely to sort of happen, if that makes sense, then. Yeah, I, I'm excited for when these teams start to cross over a little bit more, right? It still does feel like teams are a little bit more regionally defined, and I think we yeah. started to see some of that this weekend, although it was kind of already in place with Team PCG just doing a very good job of capturing people from all over the world, but... They even expanded their testing group for this event, uh, and usually a pretty geographically diverse testing group to start with, but they, they got even a little broader than that for PTLA. And I, I think that is the future of Flesh and Blood. It is not about regional teams. It is about just these global juggernauts. And as, you know, you have to kind of filter personalities. You have to figure out who works well together. You're going to uh, get a little bit more depth in these decisions as time goes on i think it starts off with i need to find 10 like-minded people who care a lot about the pro tour and that is challenging yeah but then you establish who those people are and now you're like okay i want to find people who think about the game the same way i do i want to find people who put in the same level of dedication that i do i want to find people who have the same goals as i do and as these get filtered a little bit more we're going to see the landscape of these teams change quite a bit I think, and shift away from sort of these geographical boundaries and become more about uh, like player super types and, and player archetypes rather than just, you know, I live next to you and we will play flesh and blood together. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because it's um, it's community driven. So as these events just come out, it's the it's the way that content creation and just how the community in general just just operates and moves and it's and i imagine it's just large it is largely different for each sort of game community at like oh yeah yeah you know they all have their own sort of teams or things to root for you know and i love the i'd love to see what the future in the next five to ten years of flesh and blood you know in a pro tour scene in five to ten years what is that gonna look like you know, it's, it's exciting yeah it's, it's hard to remember this because Frankly, we've accomplished a lot in a very short period of time. Mm. Ridiculously young game, like ridiculously yeah. young. And <laughs> often, you know, it's both a blessing and a curse that I think because we have achieved so much, we've earned a lot of respect. With that respect comes like some expectations. And often I think things are compared to, well, this is the way Magic does it or Yu-Gi-Oh does it or Pokemon does it. Um, and... Yeah, I mean, I I endeavor to hit a lot of those same kind of game maturity points as Magic, Yu-Gi-Oh, Pokemon. They've been around forever. They're titans of the industry. But Flesh and Blood is still very young. And I think things like, uh, you know, better global coverage, better global acknowledgement of the strengths of various regions, all that has to be built out over time. These narratives have to uh, be sussed out a bit more. And like, particularly when you think about it in terms of 
pro level events mm. like in terms of total number of pro tour and worlds i think we're at six now i believe if i'm counting correctly that was our sixth event in la yeah that that this is your fourth pro you've had two worlds and four pro tours two worlds and four pro tours i believe is the count and it's like nothing that's not, that's not <laughs> enough time to tell any stories or have any narratives there it's it's all still very young and uh you know i'm I look forward to building out more and more of these stories and letting more and more great things happen as they unquestionably will throughout the history of flesh and blood. Can I ask, uh, can I move this on and ask you a question about these uh, Armory CC decks? Sure, absolutely. So um, I suppose really there's been a lot of uh, discussion around the new one that's just been revealed, KO. And there is, there's a couple of things that have been thrown out there that um, I think is worth I, I normally i would do like which we said before we got into the interview it's quite a few things i'm like eh, i'm pretty chill whatever 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 you know there's limited conversation ah don't bother me i'm not that bothered but there's when it comes to the ko cc armory debt i just wanted to give this opportunity to give maybe just a little bit potentially more clarity around the when we first sort of saw it and the spoiler from, I can't remember what convention it was, announcing there's going to be some of these... Demo. C- the dem- yeah, yeah. The- and you probably already got asked this a hundred times already or or you already know what I'm probably going to say about the limited quantity of these Armoury decks. And then, okay, they're, they're for new players. And then we see the seat, it's KO. Cool. And then there's some... It's some cards that seem pretty good. They seem pretty, pretty good. So limited quality, good cards, meant to be for new players. Do you see there's, yeah. a, there's a bit of a worry there? Here's, here's what I can offer on that. There are aspects of this that I am very involved in. Mm-hmm. The you know creation of these armory decks, the uh, development of them. 100% I can answer all those questions about the distribution, the allocation. I have no idea. It, it, to me, I hope that everyone who wants a KO deck ends up with a KO deck. I don't know why that wouldn't be the case. I understand those words appeared on a slide. I think people are reading a lot into them. Uh, I, I think it's more you can't go to your Walmart and Target and see hundreds of these on the shelves. And it's more saying to game stores, which by the way, the Gamma Convention is rooted to the industry, not players. It is saying to them, these are worth getting. These are a thing that players will come into your store to buy. And, you know, I don't know if this is the answer. To me though, limited allocation is just a phrasing for these are armory decks and as we announced at the keynote at worlds you have to be running armory events to sell these decks yes that's the limited allocation to me like i I think there's kind of a lot of ado about nothing as i interpret it like i said i don't work on this side so i can't i can't say that authoritatively i would love to give you an authoritative answer but to me yeah that's what that insists and the vision for this was always to like get these products to players. It's not to make this a collector's item. It's not to make this something that is impossible to get. That's... It's it's counterintuitive. (laughs) It's it's completely the antithesis of how LSS operates. Like, that's the other thing. Like, you just, you never get the benefit of the doubt. I know that well enough at this point. Like, yeah, we have never done anything that points to a desire to keep especially a product like this that is designed to be something you can play an armory with the core of our mission (laughs) is to put people in stores playing armories we want you to be able to go buy this deck and use it to play games and that actually loops back around to the idea of oh there's pretty powerful cards in this yeah yeah you're damn right we want you to have a good deck we can't reprint tunic in this deck that's not realistic but we want you to have an equipment piece that is very much competing in the same space as Tunic. You have to be able to do that to participate and have a good time at the armory level. We want you to have a chance 100%. That's the goal of including a powerful card like that. No, that's, that's, that's totally 
I get that. And that's, I totally get that. That All of that side to me, I'm like, yeah, sure. But then I know what you mean. You, you're not sure about the distribution side. But even I read that and went, yeah, but limited quantities could mean like anything. Like I said, even heavy hitters is limited because there is a print run. Now that print run is pretty big, but they can't, it's, it's, big, not print, yeah. it's not printed forever, but it's pretty big. So limited print run could mean, I don't know. It's, it, it's, it's a stretchy word. And yeah. people are looking I, at I it think... going, it's the smallest. Uh, yeah. And I'm like, just, yeah, check. that's a, that's a great way to put it. It's a uh, very interpretable word, a very stretchy word. And yeah. I, I, I don't know what it means. I honestly do not. And that's not like, I don't want you to think that there is a level of miscommunication or like that's not a good explanation for how these products are. I'm not saying that. I'm saying I know nothing about it. It's not my portion no, of no, the business. No, that's fair. Like so, it, it is, it is very possible that there is some other interpretation, but to me, it's way more about these are only available to stores that run armory events that that is a limited allocation there are going to be stores out there that want to get this and when you see a good piece of equipment in it you know maybe it is something that stores that previously were not running armory events go oh i could buy a bunch of these and flip them well no you can't you need to be participating in our armory system and you need to be getting these into the hands of players who want to play armories which i am confident will happen i think these are going to be a really valuable tool to uh you know putting a player who has interest in flesh and blood who's a tcg veteran maybe putting them into an armory event and letting them have a good time and i i think also at the same time generally players who want every single flesh and blood card and want every competitive option available to them probably going to buy this too there's also kind of a third mode of engaging with this product which is where uh new player wants to engage with the game doesn't know if they want to sink the cost in yet and so they buy this armory deck and then they have local spike who goes oh i need that piece of equipment there for my deck can i give you 30 bucks for it and new player goes sure here you go and then new player has this much much cheaper deck that they now get to play with and they downgrade a little bit and they participate in their armory and they've gotten introduced to the game with a very viable deck almost for free also a lot of these arguments like the idea that oh entrenched player needs to get this thing yeah i was because going it is to a powerful piece of equipment i was going to mention that why do we act like there isn't a robust secondary market like yeah you may have to get this thing and it may be akin to something like Civic Steps, which you can go get on TCG Player. Like, I don't understand, from my perspective, I do not understand why it's a better proposition to, let, let's just use, use you. You are grinder. You are wanting to go play PTQ, and you want to have the best deck possible. And why is it a better proposition that card you need gets put in random booster pack and you hope that you open it and get to play it versus cards you need gets put in box set you know it's there you buy this you open it you have that you have the other cards or if you don't buy things by opening random packs or buying box sets you go to your single seller the same single seller <laughs> you go to for every other card you purchase yeah and you purchase this thing i i just don't see a fundamental difference in how these cards are being presented if the argument is you don't want there to be that many new cards per year you only want there to be the three core sets okay that's a fair argument you can make that point yeah i personally really like flesh and blood cards and i want a lot of them yeah and i, I want them to be uh you know released uh, throughout the year and i want new options and i want metagames to change those are all exciting things for me if you don't feel that way i, I respect that that's totally reasonable yeah um, but in a world where you want there to be more new flesh and blood cards, I just don't see the downside of the cards being released like this. No, I, I, I don't. I, the thing is, I suppose really the one thing for me is um, that I, because I don't know. I guess we don't know the, the, what happened in classic battles, and it, this is probably the uh, the glistening steel. Is it glistening? Okay, or the yeah, yeah glistening steel blade. Yeah, that that sucked. Like, that sucked. That, I, that I, sucks. I, I will just tell you, that's tough. 
there's play sets of all these cards. Okay, Ooh, play sets. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Everyone, yeah. everyone turned around and went. A... And I was, did say, if there's only two of these blue, I would be like, Ugh. lesson learned. Cool. Lesson learned. And and like the, you know, I understand the TCC box that just came out, and there's something like red bittering thorns, and that that's tough. Like that is obviously uh, there's. These are blitz decks. You can't have unlimited bittering thorns. We put as many copies as made sense to, uh, and then maybe we ask people to go to the secondary market if you need three copies of red bittering thorns. Mm -hmm. Again, I I don't think that's the worst outcome. Like I, I think that is acceptable. We got as far as we could, but in this case, we had the option to provide three of these new cards. We did so. I think that's 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 to me a huge relief. That's a that's the one question for me that I asked that went. Oh, I hope. But the fact that it, it it's a CC deck. If you need three, you put and there's a unique card in. There's three of them. Yep. Cool. Yep. Cool. That's it. You you could just buy the box and you get you don't you, you don't have and to buy them. multiple boxes to yep. get the set. Yeah. Okay. That's that's a huge that's a huge release. Um, for me, hearing that as well, which is, I'm glad that when it. It makes sense, <laughs> you know. Yeah. You know, you think, look at it. You know, well, that doesn't make any sense. And I'm glad that it's one of those things that happened. So that's awesome. Yeah, it's one of those things where like you kind of you don't fully unpack the consequences. And to be honest, like I, there is a world with the the glistening steel blade where if there were some other better cards in that box set, things are just fine. Like it just goes to the uh, you know, secondary market as a, you know, $10 card. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I think that's whatever at that point, because there's, there's a Dorinthia card and there's two Reinar cards and they're all $10 and that makes up the value of the box set and it's all good. You know, nothing to see here. Yeah. If that happens, that's fine. It was a very, very weird circumstance of there being one and only one card that people wanted from that box set. And I, I think that's what really worked against it. Uh, and yeah, lesson learned. That's fair. Lesson learned. No, that's fair. No, I, like when the dust settles, yeah, it's all, it's all good. It's all good. Can I start to sort of uh, wrap this wonderful chat? I would. I, I don't. It doesn't even feel like too much of an interview. It just feels like a great chat. Like we're just sitting down, just anywhere. Can I wrap this up with a couple of uh, uh, questions? Someone is uh, people. Some of my patrons have slipped into my pocket would love to answer these questions uh now that i have retreat retreated from twitter i this, these are my windows to answer these questions so you got to take them when you get them go ahead and, and fire them at me and i will give you an answer brilliant okay so this comes first question comes from james armstrong one of our amazing level two judges from the uk so how much of a completed product is a set when it is handed over to the devs to play testing is it pretty much there? Is it just needs polishing or having bugs worked out? Or is it very much a rough sketch that needs a lot of fleshing out um, when while you're developing it? So that's the question. I always feel like I it's know a, the answer, but yeah, but that's the it's question. It's a great question. It's a great question. Here's how great it is. I already answered it. James is also a patron of Andrew Dice Commando. Yeah. I did Dice Commando's podcast. He asked me the same question over there. I answered it over on the Dice Commando <laughs> podcast. So go listen to that one. Go we'll we'll that cross one. plug. We'll cross plug a little bit I will, uh, if you want to hear the answer to this. I'll put the link below. There you go. Sorry. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so Craig Johnson, which young hero currently in the game would you think would make a good adult hero? I think the Emperor rules. I think the Emperor is such a cool hero. But you killed now, him. <laughs> yeah, he's dead. That's fine. Uh, but I, I don't. I don't know. I haven't done any exploratory work to know if like Emperor in CC is good, balanced. I, like I, I have. I have no answer as far as that goes. I do know I love the Emperor in Blitz, and if it showed up in CC, I'd be pretty excited about it. Um, but he's dead, so that'll never happen. Sorry. Oh, come on, Brian. That was an easy answer, because you said you picked the dead guy. <laughs> he's dead. It's nice and simple. I've, here we go. This is one of those... Uh, I'm going to bookmark this and just say, by the way, he said he's dead. He's dead. He said he's dead. It's five years later, I'll bring this up. 
He's dead. Somehow he returned. <laughs> what, what do you want? No, 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 Somehow no. he returned. Andrew Rayner, he says, are we likely? This one has actually been kind of liked by quite a few of our patrons. Are we likely to see new heroes come through the expansion slot? I could see it happening. Could absolutely see it happening. Yeah. Just uh yeah. just a cheeky drop. Plenty of cards, don't need more. Here's a cheeky drop. Why not? Why not? Why not? I think that's totally reasonable. Uh, expansion slot, it just lets us do a lot more. It lets us be a lot more flexible. Uh, you know, you're seeing it already with the way we're releasing CC and Blitz cards, and I yeah, I have no reason to believe at some point we wouldn't want to go ahead and, and put a hero in that slot. Yeah, the, 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 another, it was a question that was kind of thrown around there, and it was just tying into the expansion plot. They, they feel a lot like Pat... Is it, I don't know if it's fair to say this, but like in a digital card game, we always put an analogy or tie it to something that we already know. It feels like a slight patch notes, especially when it came to Prism. Right? You were, hmm. That's how it feels. might not be what it yeah. was intended, but as it, some of us feel like, yeah, it's like a patch note. I think that's a reasonable assessment. I It is different in a class-centric game, right? Mm. And you go to a game that is just kind of, you know, Magic is going to do its five colors every set. All five are represented. So it's very easy to build out these kind of multi-set threads. You just pass them forward to the next set or the next set or the next set. And yeah. you have that adaptability. Flesh and Blood was relying on full expansion sets to do that previously. It's just a very limiting model. A uh, lot more freedom under the idea of um, these expansion slots. And yeah, I, I think Patch Notes is a good analogy and maybe a little bit slower i, I would say a lot slower but <laughs> yeah of, of, uh, it, yeah but it's as as good as we can get that's yeah, what it is it's, uh, it's as fast as we can move uh and i think that's a very good thing for the health of the game so that is an interesting thing because um i, I loved I, I loved the concept of dust till dawn and i think it was quite kind of like this moment of where you sort of what i felt very much and i think a lot of us did as well uh, that it the expansion sets just had this weird space of this is really exciting but kind of it's because there's nothing much more we can do with it it is mm. it's a giant expansion slot and then you go you can't draft so like, okay is it something that you want to revisit and this is this is something that since we're talking about it, it's not really a question it's something i'll just come with that is it something you want to try and explore? Or do you feel like the actual expansion slots from draft sets is actually like a a solved solution to things, potentially? I don't think it's the final solve. I no. think it is it is good. I think there is something to do in the veins of the expansion set that looks different from what we were doing previously. Yeah. I think there is a way to better execute on the concept of something like a Dust Till Dawn, uh, something that is not a full-fledged limited release, but does still offer that expandability. Um, you know, maybe there is a alt play mode where there is some kind of limited component. Maybe there is, uh, you know, just a, a different structure where something like a smaller supplemental release is available to us. Um, but uh, I do think there were flaws with kind of the supplemental sets as we were doing them before. Not looking to return to that. I think expansion slot is a partial solve, but there's still space to do something more in the supplemental range than full featured release, I think. Yeah, I the, the, the thing that I really loved about the expansion slots for me was that it allowed you to actually create some pretty impactful cards without sure. having to... Because Dust Till Dawn, to me, felt like there are some really good impactful cards in this set that really does a good number for Bolton, a good number for Levia, and it released... It, it, it probably did a bit, you know... I can see that it did a lot for Prism... Uh, the new Prism and Vincent, right? But for Bolton and Levia, there was a lot of cards in there. I was like, this, you wouldn't need to do this if there was an expansion slot, right? You could have just, like, Le the Levia hero could just been an expansion slot with one or two things later down the line. And that would have, that, that ultimately ended up being like Sliverin's Shadowpede, for example, mm. and her hero card. 
if that was an expansion slot thing, you can go, oh, there you go. And everyone's like, whoa, it's done it. But Death of Dawn was like, but here is this chunk of other cards, which I'm, I don't know. I suppose it's it's hindsight, isn't it? You look at it later on. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. I, those I think uh, like those, those other cards have a function. They do. Is it a broad enough function to sort of justify that occupying an entire release block on <laughs> yeah. my calendar. And to, to me, the answer is no. It yeah. just doesn't deliver enough. And, it, you know, it's a, it's a dramatic shift. We are just offering far more meaningful cards now than ever before in the history of Flesh and Blood. And it is, uh, I, I think it's a really exciting time to be a Flesh and Blood player. I mean, obviously, there's always limits to this. I, I am very aware of product fatigue i i know uh like at some point it becomes too much i i promise i don't want anyone to get the impression that it's just like we can make infinite flesh and blood cards forever and <laughs> there is certainly uh, a limit to how much you can put out there but i think there were too few flesh and blood cards being made before i think that was pretty clear yeah on a per year basis just not enough cool impactful cards coming out that led to things staying pretty static for a long time. It led to things like releases coming out and not having a huge impact because they were, uh, you know, very small portions of a set and you kind of only got one chance to get it right. And there's dangers with both being too weak, but being too strong. If you don't have routine printings, those are, those are both equal risks. So I think a lot of the release cadence has pushed out some of that fear and has allowed us to make impactful sets like heavy hitters and you see what the impact of something like heavy hitters is yeah that's followed on quite nicely actually uh to johnny chapman's question is there has there any successful decks emerged that is not it's been under the radar during the playtesting and have players found a combination that was not discovered through playtesting um thinking about sort of the breakouts from heavy hitters and we were playing with all of these decks you know mm -hmm. we had hatchets hatchets warriors both kasai dorinthia uh they they were well explored olympia all, all these heroes were well explored internally our ko decks look very similar to what the ko decks look like in the real world we reached most of the same conclusions uh the one that has defied expectations a little bit was victor goldman has turned out to be a little bit better than we thought not that we thought he was you know a complete yeah. dog but, uh, and, and that's not, it's interesting because from a deck building perspective, our decks look the same. Like, I, I think internally our decks looked very similar. We just thought it was kind of, and also ran with Bravo. We didn't feel like it really introduced too much new to the metagame. Um, and it was just, you know, a, a good Guardian, but ultimately another Guardian. And Victor's impact seems to be quite a bit higher than that, where he's very much supplanted bravo where we kind of saw him appearing alongside bravo at first anyway yeah um so so that was probably the most surprising takeaway from heavy hitters otherwise things have mostly played out as we expected which is good like that's a good spot to be in yeah i mean it, it for, for for one i think ko was this massive breakout hero that's came out from heavy hitters i'm sure and there, and definitely some others as well and it's is it quite hard to sort of as you're sort of making this and the heavy hitters is i don't know i was going to assume say a year ago you're making this and then can you try as you're designing this as well as the cc starter decks with all these new cards coming out for us now sitting here for we're sort of looking at Oh geez, KO's just came out and look at this starter set, look at this stuff. He's just gonna be bazoom straight off to the moon. That's how it feels. It might not actually happen because, you know, part of the misfell is not out yet, right? So you never know, you never know. But is it quite difficult to design stuff and actually just sort of go, where's this gonna be? Because like in a oh, year's time, who knows? Cause sometimes these Pro Tours throw heroes like old him. He, he he wasn't he didn't look like he was going to win this pro tour and he did and it just went bonk and then he was right near the top and he just flew out and everyone's like oh okay did didn't see this coming so quick but when we were designing it there was a vision he might actually be around here a bit long you know what i mean it's yeah trying to predict no, the it's, future 
It's very hard. It's very hard. There's obviously a huge amount of uncertainty, a huge amount of risk. We make estimations, but you never know how they're going to be delivered upon. Um, thus far, projections look good. Mm -hmm. They're holding with what we expected. Uh, that goes for KO as well, which it is funny to see how, kind of how KO is being received. You can go look at data from the Pro Tour, which is available. KO had a sub 50% win rate at the Pro Tour. One of KO's best matchups was Dromai, which is soon to leave the metagame. Uh, Dromai eats a tremendous amount of preparatory space, mm -hmm. uh, sideboard space, even, even game planning. Uh, with that hero gone, I think there are multiple viable options that previously were squeezed off um, by just horrible Dromai matchups that, <laughs> again, pretty effective into KO. Uh, so I think KO is being a bit overhyped right now, which is kind of how these things go. It was the most played deck, so obviously a lot of people believe in it. And I don't want to make it sound like I don't think KO is a good deck. And Ko is a very good deck. I think we can all uh, see he is he is a good deck, but is he? Yeah. Is it? It's fair to say you know he's not he's not Starvo. He's not the Starvo levels. It's not the Lexi he's not, levels. He's not Starvo. He's not Lexi. He's not Oldham. He's not Dromai in this meta game. Like there are Chain. Uh, <laughs> Brian. I, I don't I don't think he's Hatchet's Dorinthia in this meta game. Honestly, I think that deck is far more of a threat long-term to the metagame than something like KO is because KO is very, very straightforward. Mm -hmm. uh, very, I won't say easy to plan around because it's, he's designed to have this ceiling that can always win you a game. You need heroes like that. I think I've talked a bunch about Starvo and I guess, yes, Starvo, I, yeah. <laughs> yes, Starvo was a mistake, but Starvo did a lot of good for the game, a lot of good for the game. He allowed players to find a hero to onboard with, to understand the game, to understand just, I make offensive output and good things happen. KO operates on a similar axis, just toned down from where Starvo was, and does it without the disruption. So you get to play your game into KO and feel pretty happy about it. And look, I know there's exceptions to that. There are some disruptive brute cards, but they are few and far between. They have... Uh, weaknesses or flaws, you can play through them in a lot of instances. So I, I think the experience is very different. It is mostly just, I am an aggro deck, I am trying to kill you. And that is one of the best things for a new player to be able to learn the game with. It's also one of the best things to have be the villain in your format, to be the quote-unquote best <laughs> deck. If it's a straightforward I do damage deck, there's going to be a lot of metagame innovations. And you know, I think we're setting up for this kind of triangle meta right now is how I see things moving in the future. I think there's Hatchet's Dorinthia, there's Victor Goldmane, and then there is Ko sitting at the very apex of the metagame. There's a bunch of heroes mm. that have a really nice matchup spread against all three of those decks or have a slightly more polarized strong matchup against two out of those three decks. Uh, things like Kasai come to mind. Things like Tech Lavosin, you find <laughs> nice matchups into a couple of those decks. Yeah. Viscera is good into all those decks. Like Viscera is just yeah. completely fine <laughs> into those decks. I, 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 I would happily play Viscera into all of them. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, man. Like I'm, just two the, of them, I agree. Two of them, I agree. The numbers. One of them. The numbers don't lie. The numbers don't lie. They present unalterable <laughs> facts, and I, I think like you can play Viscerai into all those decks. I'm not saying you're favored. Like, I, I just no, think it's no. reasonable to play Viscerai into all those decks. And with Dromai out of the picture, you're going to find more and more options like that. Some of these decks can shift in certain ways. And I do think, like, I can say those things, and there were elements of Viscerai that had to be very tailored towards Dromai. You just couldn't give up the deck slots you needed to to account for some other things. And that's going to be a r routinely occurring thing throughout this new metagame. There's a lot of evolutions that are still to take place and I'm excited to see where it goes. Plus there's part the misfell around the corner, which throws everything for a loop. So that's absolutely true. I, I, he brought up this right, man. He's uh us rune blades. I'm going, I'm just, I'm going, I'm doing this for the rune blades, man. Look, I see this tattoo. Yeah. This tattoo mm -hmm. here. I'm doing it for you boys. It's been a while. I can, our tears are rolling down our eyes. Is that yep. it feels like it's a while. 
since um, it feels it's, it's probably factually a while like i i think it's probably just rune blades have gone the longest since seeing support right now although you did i, I like it how everyone goes oh it's been ages i'm like right, i don't want to let you know but there was a vin set <laughs> that did yeah. come out that everyone's like ah, that doesn't count it's been ages <laughs> but but even even at this point like dtd has kind of been ages like it's it's been a little mm. while uh we've been a couple sets since there we know a third set on the horizon and look if there's oh i'm not asking for i mean yeah we there's so much we don't know about i don't want to go down that road of going hey what's next like bro we haven't yeah, even yeah. Done, we haven't even, we don't even know what chi is yet <laughs> i i just think like we have a cadence at this point and it seems like every time a class starts complaining like oh it's been so long since we've been supported they're the next one up we rotate through like we're aware of how long it's been since a class has been supported rune blades coming it's I, just coming everyone know. knows that we know i i suppose really i'm looking at this from someone that's been making a lot of this right decks this right lover in it i i'm starting to get a vibe that there is a ch i know a change in the direct of on the feel and the direction of this hero a little bit from the days of blood chief skeleta morivian skies rosetta thorns creepers are your sort of like ugh, that's a very raw strong way of playing this game and then i see cards like um Oh, I think it's bequest the beyond bequest the something or I don't know that that cars <laughs> cars a long name mm -hmm. a viscerai specialization and sonata phantasmia another viscerai specialization and these cards are telling us a completely design direction that just seems to be totally different and I know it's not something you could probably answer but is that is there is there a sort of idea around viscerai that is like okay the whole smoothie and skies thing it was cool but maybe there's something more i don't know am i am i am i push am i pushing a button here <laughs> i think I your sample size is too small man that's what happens with all of these things is like you go oh here's this tremendous shift in how viscerai is being designed and there's two cards to pull from they're just two cards oh, like, I know. And, and they do different things but they say his name say, on like, it you know yeah, yeah, they they absolutely have his name on it. I I say the same thing when we're in kind of these lull periods for a hero. It's just been a while since we touched the hero. When we come back around to Runeblade, I think you'll have a better idea of where Runeblade is headed, where it's going to stand going forward. Uh, I also will shout out that typically there's... It changes all the time, but there's typically two heroes I call out as my favorite heroes in all of Flesh and Blood. Maybe three. Maybe. You know, when I'm like from a uh, just nostalgia standpoint and what a hero means to me, I often mention Arachne. When I think about the hero, hero I enjoy playing the most, kind of, and, and one that also has that attachment for me, it is Azuri. And then when I'm just thinking about like heroes I've actually gotten to play in tournaments and heroes that I physically love the experience of playing and I love the mechanics and I love them operations of them it's viscerai that's my third answer it's a hero i absolutely love i want to be part of the metagame when there was a 3-0 viscerai at the pro tour you're damn straight i was the one being like get this viscerai on camera right now i have such an affinity for not only viscerai but the entire rune blade class just a matter of time man just it's, a, it's matter always of just time. a matter of time there's the, and then everyone will throw up the du the dust play conversation they'll say dust blade and You'll say we can have this conversation I, 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 if I, you go spend a week playing with Dustblade. You go spend a week playing with that card. I did. As almost no one has. Like I there's very few people who have sat down for a week of dedicated Dustblade testing. Meanwhile, me and the development team have done it on probably four separate occasions <laughs> now where we try <laughs> and find a window to bring back Dustblade. That card is messed up. It's a messed up card. It's not fun to play against. And go spend a week playing with it. And if you still want Dustblade after that, play with and against it, come back to me. If you still want Dustblade, we can have a conversation. But I don't think you will. No, that's maybe the, I, I know for the current Dustblade ruling, just as much as all the prison players with their, you know, the second Luminaris, sort of like, well, don't, I don't, we don't want it. Is there a thematic world? Because Dustblade had so much, like, put, like it had so much, like, 
theme, everything pouring out of this with the light versus shadow stuff. And it just seems like such a really, it's like, you know, you can tell that it was wanted to be in there because of that story oh, yeah. it was telling. Is there a world for a, a just a, a dust tool two or so a dust blade two? You know what I mean? Like the, we want this, but this is busted. So here's the, you know, a realistic Maybe. Bit. Maybe. Maybe. Some, sometimes, like, to me, it comes off as trying a little hard. Like, we had the chance, kind of blew it, made a card that didn't really, you know, like, will will there be another Runeblade sword? Sure. sure. Will it be Dustblade number two? <laughs> oh, no, it's I, la- I know it feels, I know it feels lazy, but I'm doing, I don't, I don't it wasn't for me, because I don't really care. Dustblade can go... You know, I've got my Caulfield copy. It's fine. It's a piece of history. It happened. We made a mistake. The meme was born from Dustblade, yeah. right? It was just one of the questions that one of the patrons uh, threw in there. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay. We'll do yeah, I, I know. I, I I think people just... It wasn't you know, they, min-max want... games, by the way. <laughs> it probably was. It I don't probably trust. Was. They have spies everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> uh, people want Viscera to be good. They, they want Runeblades to be good. I want Runeblades to be good. But I, I always say, it's like... It's very easy to band-aid these heroes, throw some numbers at them, make them good. That doesn't make them fun. That doesn't make their identity well supported. It doesn't make the game better just to do that. Like just making a hero better for the sake of making them better isn't always going to leave us in a better position than we were previously. And would Dustblade make a hero better? Sure. It, it would improve Blades. <laughs> oh, shit. Does it does it make the game better? No, I honestly don't think so. And we're up to the challenge. Runeblades will have their moment again. Don't need to use kind of this hack to go ahead and insert this kind of unjustly powerful card into the equation to really throw things off. Thank you so much, Brian. I'm going to... You've you've, you've spent a a brilliant hour and 20 minutes. Well, realistically, another even 10 minutes more before we even got going. I fully appreciate the time that you've given me to have this conversation and will i see you at pro tour amsterdam yeah i will be there absolutely i'll be there uh doing some casting hanging out enjoying myself uh amsterdam actually very important piece of my own tcg history the first pro tour i ever played uh in magic was in amsterdam and i had never left the country before I qualified for that pro tour. So that's where I got my passport. It was the first time I went to Europe, the first time I ever left the US and it kind of opened this entire world to me of traveling and playing TCGs and knowing people around the world. And uh, it is very, very exciting for me to be able to go back there, experience Amsterdam again. And then after that, we go to Osaka, Japan. And the reason I started playing TCGs competitively because I was a very sheltered, uh, frankly, very poor individual, but always had this idea that I wanted to go to Japan. No way I could afford it. No way I could make it happen. So I had this brilliant idea. Well, I'm good at TCGs. Why don't I just go and play these PTQs and eventually I will qualify for a tournament in Japan. I never qualified for a pro tour that actually happened in Japan. I've never been to Japan. So I get to go there for Worlds and I feel like I'm like, bringing my TCG journey full circle with these two destinations. And it's a, a really exciting thing for me. Yeah, that's that's so exciting. And it's also cool as well, because um, my first uh, out-of-country event was Utrecht, the Calling Utrecht. That I, Very cool. That I missed. <laughs> mm. Good effort, though. Yeah, Good effort. But I was, I stayed, but it was over in Amsterdam as well. So yeah, it's a, it's, it's again a, a very special place. So I was extremely excited that you uh, announced that Pro Tour is going to be in Amsterdam. Um, yeah, great city. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you so much, everyone, for checking out as well. Check below, down below for the Dice Commandos uh, interview that Brian uh, did. There's a, one of the questions. Oh, it feels like it's so long ago. <laughs> I can't remember what it was. But go check out that video as well for some more and different questions um, that Brian has answered. And thank you for uh, checking it out. Thank you, Brian. My pleasure, my friend. We'll do it again sometime. <laughs>